Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia's musical Jewel Box. We are talking today with music director Dirk Brosse about Mozart's last symphony, Symphony Number no. 41, now known as the Jupiter Symphony. It's a wild symphony full of crazy modern ideas, and I can't wait to dive into this with you. So, Dirk, hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great piece. It's probably one of the most impressive uh, masterpieces, at least symphonies that uh, Mozart ever, ever wrote. Um, and um, as we all know, he wrote his last three symphonies actually in uh, less than two months. And, and, and it was uh, Arnaud Cour, who after having studied 40, 50 years of uh, the music of Mozart, who came up with the idea that probably the idea of Mozart was to, to create like one, one big instrumental oratorio. But it is um, uh, absolutely clear that that very last symphony, number 41, uh, was stuck out. It was really, really a great, a great, uh, a great piece. Although it was written in a quite a difficult, uh, difficult period in, in, in uh, Mozart's uh, life. Uh, his financial situation was not that good. Um, I think a, a, a very, a very first remarkable uh, event that happened in his life that he moved from Salzburg to to Vienna. That was really, really important because the, in those days, and probably still is nowadays, Vienna was really the center of the of the, of the classical uh, music world. So everything that happened in the classical music world that happens in, uh, in in Vienna for sure. It's the time. It's the time where he also met uh, met with Haydn, which is which is very a very important event. They be, they became friends and they were even 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 playing uh, playing playing music together. And um, I think a very a very important uh, event in Mozart's professional uh, life was that in in uh, in the late 80s, 80, 1787, 80, he was uh, uh, nominated as a court composer, which was uh, an, an an enormous event for those days. So by the by the emperor. Uh, Emperor Joseph II, he officially, uh, 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 he, he became court composer. That didn't mean that, that he earned a lot, of, a lot of money. Still, he, he was obliged to look for, for commissions. And, 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 and very often, uh, he, he was writing the music because he, he, he himself decided to, 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 to write his last three symphonies without being commissioned. And this is actually also in the attitude of being a composer in uh, those days also means uh, the, 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 he opened actually the, 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 the gate to freedom. That a composer really wanted to compose the music he, 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 he wanted to, to compose. But I think in the last four or five years of, uh, of his life, he really suffered a lot because there was a lack of money. Um, uh, and it was also, there was not much money around in Vienna in those days because all the money went uh, to, the, to the war. There was a, a, a great war going on in those days. It was a, a, the Austria-Turkish uh, uh, Turkish war. So all the attention and all the uh, financi finances went, uh, went uh, to, that, to that war. And his financial situation was so bad that he had to leave Vienna with his, uh, with his children, with his family. He had to leave Vienna. He had to move to the, to the suburbs and to, to a small village uh, near, um, near, near uh, Vienna. And because there was no money, he started borrowing money from his, uh, from his friends. As we all know, at the age of 20, 27, 28, 29, he, he joined uh, Freemasonry in, uh, in Vienna. So he had some very, very close friends who supported him with, uh, with money, but still he, he, could not, he could not refund it. And I think uh, the, the last couple of years uh, must have been awful uh, for himself and his family, although it was probably the most creative uh, uh, passage in his, in his life. If we see that, that in the last three, four years, especially, especially even the last year that he, he wrote his, 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 one, of his, one of his major, major works, uh, uh, like the Magic Flute and, and, the, and, and his final piano concerto. And then of course the, 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 the famous clarinet concerto, the Ave Verum, and uh, last but not least, the unfinished um, uh, Requiem. 
Right. And so if we if we focus in on, you know, these incredibly productive periods at the end of his life. And so he dies in December of 1791. Right. And um, this symphony was completed um, in 1788 with uh, the 39th and 40th symphony. Right. Now, Nicholas Harnacor has a has a has a little note here that he, because he made a, a recording of these three final Mozart symphonies um, a couple of years ago. And he said at the time that he believed that these symphonies formed a set, that they, they were written in the same two month period, which I think was the summer or like August or like July and August of 1788. And that because there are certain features present in some symphonies and not in other symphonies that he thinks Mozart was con conceiving of them all as this one uninterrupted work. Do you have a take on that? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a very interesting uh, point of view. I, I never conducted those three symphonies in a row. I always conducted them separately. So in order to have, to have that, that feel and that insight, uh, it would be interesting to, 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 to go more deeply into not only into, into the, 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 the each symphony in itself, which I, which, I, which I did, which I always do when I conduct a major work, when I, when I conduct anyway, whatever work it is. But it would, it would be interesting to, to rehearse it and to perform it uh, in, in, or record it in, in, in one flow. And, and then probably one another would really uh, feel that there is, there is a connection between, uh, between the, 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 the three last symphonies. Actually, uh, uh, what I can tell that is that uh, at a later age, he became more and more interested in Baroque music and especially in the music of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach and in the, in, the, in the linear way of writing in the, in the, in the counterpoint. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can, you can see in, 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 in the three symphonies, there are uh, all of a sudden very sometimes complex chromatic lines appearing that 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 that, w that never appeared in other in other symphonies. So there are some musical elements, so like like the return to the Baroque, the the, the return to the fugue, the structure of his music, the complexity, the instrumentation that becomes more dense, um, the introduction of the of the chromatic lines. So in, in one or another way, you can feel that those three symphonies uh, are written were written in the same time period uh, of, of, of two months. Right. Yeah. And so I guess we can, we can use that to dive into this symphony bit by bit, obviously, you know, it's kind of famous for that Baroque inspiration in the, in the fourth movement, but you know, there are, there are three movements that come before that too. And they do, there are, there are these connections between them. So let's start with the first, the first movement in the symphony. Um, and, Generally speaking, this, you know, it follows rather traditional first movement expectations and that it's written in sonata form. Um, and it, it does all the things you want it to do. Um, maybe not everyone is on board with us when we just throw out words like sonata form. So can you give us a brief summary on what is sonata form, especially as it pertains to a symphony? Give us, give us the, the bird's eye landscape of what do we mean when musicians say sonata form? Because it's not a sonata, it's a symphony, but, you know, that's a kind of... Well, first of all, uh, when we go to the basic of uh, sonata form, it's a composition structure. It's like a, a metric frame, an architectural frame uh, used by classical composers in which they uh, could uh, 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 write their, their music. Actually, it's basically, it, you have three episodes. You have, apart from a very short introduction, like a couple of bars, just to set the mood of a, of a, of a, of a symphony, for example, you have the, 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 the first section. The first section um, is what we call the exposition. The exposition in which the composer presents, literally presents the musical ideas to, to, the, to, to, the, to the public. And most of the times we have uh, two themes. We have theme A that is written in uh, the tonica, and so in the in the tonality of the of the symphony. And then there is a, a B team. Very often the, the second team is in contrast musically, rhythmically, in contrast with the first team. And also 
very often it is presented in the dominant. So if a symphony is written in C major, so very often the second theme will be presented in the dominant, so in, in, in the key of G. Um, very often this episode is repeated because in those days, the repetition of the music in order to get acquainted and to get familiar with the musical material was very, very important. So this is, this is very standard, this is very standard. And then we have the B section. And actually, this is the most important uh, section uh, where we can uh, discover the creativity of the composer. So what is the composer doing? He's taking little elements, small elements. It can be bits of melodies. It can be bits of rhythms. And he starts playing, playing around with it. So going away from the basic idea and, and just playing around in terms of tonalities, instrumentation, he's uh, experimenting. So this is like, like, like a, a, an episode where he can show uh, his artistry and his, uh, his, his fantasy. In order to go back to the standard first piece, which is almost completely repeated. So the A section, the B section and the A plus section is almost exactly a repetition of what we heard in the exposition. And sometimes, mostly, very often, there is like a, a coda. It's like a musical signature, just, just to finish to finish the piece. And uh, some of the, of the great composers uh, became famous because of the, the B section, because of the, of the development section. And, uh, and one absolute master in, 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 in exploring the development is uh, Joseph Haydn, Beethoven, of course. But also Mozart, and you can you can feel uh, his first his first symphony that he wrote at the age of six or seven, five, six or seven. You can already smell that there is a an enormous uh, a creativity in the in the, in, in the mind of uh, of that genius composer. And and the more uh, he composes, uh, the more we can see that uh, the the development the B section uh, be, becomes more and more creative and becomes more and more genius, like in, in this symphony. And actually, actually the, 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 the development, uh, like especially in this symphony, can become a composition on its own. Right. And then specifically in, in this symphony, in his last symphony, um, there are two fun little things. One of them is more specific to this one, but um, going in order of, of, the, of the way we have these things here. Um, Rather commonly, you know, when the A section comes back, the exposition, as we call it, we have the exposition, the development, and then a recapitulation, which we all now know is the word recap, but, you know, it's a recapitulation. Um, when that opening material returns, but commonly tricky composers like to give us fake outs, as you might say, where we think the material has returned, um, but it actually hasn't yet. And we mostly know that because it, it has to come back in the right key. And this symphony has one of those moments where you hear the opening material and you think, oh, we're coming back, but it's a lie. And it hasn't happened just yet. And composers do this for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I would love to hear your uh, interpretive opinion on what is the emotional component of a false recapitulation? And why do we, what do you think drives Mozart to do it in this specific symphony? What, how, does, how does it heighten our anticipation. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say because I cannot go into Mozart's mind. Uh, did he want to tease the public? Did he want, on purpose, give the false uh, recapitulation? Uh, of course, yes. I would say yes because you hear one element of the first theme that reminds us of the recapitul of the recapitulation, but in the other voices, the development is going on. So it's not literally a, a, a recapitulation. It's, it's one moment you think, oh my God, it, it, it's, it's going to happen. But also, we, we, he is also misleading us because of the key. He, he, he brings in the, the false recapitulation in a false key, in, 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 in F, whether it should, be, it should be C. So I think he's, he's really playing around with us. And it's, it's, it's just a, a, a bit later uh, at, at, at bar 189, uh, to be precise, where in the key of C major, there is that recapitulation. So the, the, the only, the, I think, I, I'm sure he, he, 
he wants, he wants to fool us. But another thing, before the recapitulation, we should point out is that normally in an exposition, we have two teams. We have two musical teams, an A team in a, in a, in a certain character and a B team, which is very often more lyrical than the first team. But Mozart is introducing a third team, just to confuse us a little bit more. And this, this third team uh, it comes, uh, it's, it's a team actually from, from an opera, it's from an opera uh, aria that, that, that he composed earlier on. It's a, a team called Un Bacio di Mano. So it's a, it's a hand kiss, uh, a kiss on the hand, Un Bacio di Mano. And it's literally what, what, what the baritone is, uh, is singing. If you listen to that aria, it's really copy paste, and he he puts it he he really plants it as a third team in his in his in his in, in his exposition, never done before. So maybe he he had that. I, th I think for me these are signs that that uh, he wanted to escape from the sonata form. So he's really opening a door to the romantic period here. So mm -hmm. I think enough. Of, of, of the classical form and in musical in, in, in musical structure, in musical language, in the expression of the themes, in uh, the use of the dynamics and the instrumentation, you can feel that he wants to escape from a form that, that he loved and that, that, that in a way he invented uh, and he wanted to escape from that form. And, and with this symphony, definitely he's opening, he's opening the doors to Beethoven's first symphony and, 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 and so on and so on and so on. So this is very, very, very unusual. There is a third team and that derives from, from another composition he made. So he's stealing from himself. Which sometimes is just good to save time. Yeah. 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 So, so that's our, that's our first movement. Um, so let's, let's, let's carry on through here because especially, and I, I do love that, that concept that he's taken something from, um, uh, a vocal piece of music, because as we get to the fourth movement, there's a couple points we can make about how important opera buffa is to Mozart's, you know, entire output. And this kind of, we're going to talk about a fusion of things, but we'll get there when we get to the fourth movement. So let's go into the second movement now. And, um, the second movement is also in sonata form. And this to me feels a, like a feels like a rather modern idea because if we go back to like the origins of the symphony and where does the symphony come from it took a long time to mold and it really it never stopped molding i mean there's not like there's this one moment we can say that yes now symphonies are completed they continue to change and they continue to grow in this kind of lengthening of this well even the fact that there are four movements as opposed to three movements but this how the the slow movement in the middle became more emotional. And then as it became more emotional, it became more like, as we call it, the heart of the piece. And then it gets longer and it gets longer. And then eventually, as Mozart starts doing here, it starts to become a whole sonata form, all of its own work. Whereas before it would just be kind of like, you know, they even they have a word to say on Dante Cantabile, as if it's just, you know, a walking pace like a song. It's a little break, but now we have real structure in it. Um, and how do you feel this? What is the, we were talking about, talk about counterpoint a lot here, but I think the, a broader version of counterpoint, how does the second movement serve as a counterpoint to our first movement? How does so the first movement is grand and bombastic and the second movement brings us back a little bit, but still keeps yeah. that structure. For me, it is, it is very romantic again, with this movement and with the, with the way he, he, he the concept of the, of the themes, um, the way he is ornamenting the, the few basic tones of that of that of that melody, again for me opens the door to to romanticism. And still, uh, there there is also a lot of contrast in dynamics. So you, you you could say in a way, and this is very personal, but it's like a pre Beethoven. All of a sudden, you would not expect there is a a, a, a forte chord. And, and he repeats it, and then some of the themes are played really strong, and then and then and then like like it like in an echo, um, uh, all of a sudden a, a completely different uh, different dynamic, and then as we go to bar to bar to bar eighteen nineteen ish uh, with the, all the syncopes, this is very modern. 
It's, it's really, really, really very, very, very interesting. And, and, and probably in a way it reminds us on a, on, on, on a Sarabande, a rather a Sarabande than, 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 than an Andante Cantabile in a 3 4. And, and although it's very far away from a Sarabande in a way, because originally a, a Sarabande, it's, it's a Spanish dance. Uh, but the way the, the structure of the melody and, 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 and all the ornamentations in, in the melody are in a way, and the use of the chromatic micro intervals in a way, a bit, it's, it's different from, from other second movements, that's for sure. And um, depending, also depending on the, on the tempo you take, because there are no, no tempo indications, so some interpretations, we'll talk later about interpretations, but some, some, some people, some conductors do it very, very, very slow. And then I, I think it becomes a bit, uh, what would I say? Uh, it, if, you look at, if you look at the texture, this, this melodies and this tempo needs a flow. In, in, in order, in order to, 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 to come closer to the, to the, to the Sarabande feel. That's, that's what I think. That's, that's my approach anyway. So right then, now uh, we can move on to movement three. Now movement three for Beethoven becomes something really wild and really fun. And Mozart doesn't quite take us all the way to, to, the, to the scherzo world, but we do get... Um, a couple interesting things to happen you know well i say a couple one specific that i'd like to talk about obviously because i have an agenda here <laughs> that happens in in movement three which as it relates to the fourth movement but biggest uh takeaway from the third movement is that it is um like many german composers a lendler and uh would you like to tell us a little bit about this these lendler waltzes and why these german composers like them so much well, the, actually, the the, the, the the Lander, it's the it's the it's the, the godfather of the waltz of the later mm-hmm. later waltz. Um, it, it was a very very popular uh, Austrian uh, Austrian dance, um, and um, it, it's it's family of the minuetto, of course, but it's 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 lighter. And it, this was music just like the minuetto. People loved to 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 dance on it. But it was uh, while the minuetto was was very. Uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, you can say for the for the bourgeoisie, uh, for mm-hmm. the aristocracy. The lender was really a folk dance that was really danced by 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 local people, by 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 by, by, by farmers and people people uh, that were living a very 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 simple uh, simple life. Um, uh, and and what what is interesting about about this uh, lender, minuetto lender. Um, that is again the use of the chromatic lines. Uh, he's never he's never done something like like this before. If we if we look, for example, uh, to the texture, there was like one one chromatic pro- progression um, around bar 40, 44 ish, where you have this also contrapuntal chromatic lines, and it, it, it harmonically it becomes very very weird and and. And, and, and very very complex for 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 those days, and uh, another remarkable thing about about this uh, uh, third movement is that he is already introducing the four notes of the of the fugue. Yeah. Uh, and, and 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 let me tell you something uh, about the four notes. I mean, it's it's it apparently is something a four note theme that later on is used for a fugue was. Was uh, very popular already in the in the Renaissance, like like the like the composers like uh, Josquin Desprez and and and, and Okehan, uh, they already in the 16th century they already were in love with the with the with the themes uh, consisting of, of four notes. But um, I, I just want to mention here that uh, also those four notes were very popular in Mozart's uh, works, not only in the in the in the last pages of the third movement. And of course, the entire fourth movement is built on it. But um, also in his first symphony, when he, I just mentioned that before, when he wrote his first symphony at the age of six, seven years old, he already used those four notes. So it's amazing that in his first symphony and in the last symphony are based on, the, on, the, on that same uh, series of uh, four uh, notes. But also in his famous credo of the Misa Brevis in F major, 
uh, those four notes are, 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 are featured. And also in the first movement of the symphony number no. 33, it's very, very obvious. And then also in the, in the, in the trio of the minuet of the same symphony, we hear those four notes. And now he's using them in a, again in his last symphony. So he, there was a relationship uh, musically, historically, but also in the works of, uh, of, uh, of, of Mozart. There is something with us, with a, a theme consisting of those four, four notes. But it's very intelligent that he's already announcing, uh, already introducing those four notes. Uh, so the, 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 the listener already had those four notes in the, in the ear, and all of a sudden, uh, because it's really, he's using it in the very last minute, very last seconds, very last minute of, uh, of, 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 the, of the trio, then we have, of course, the recapitulation of the first material of the of the Ledla, and then we hear it full size in the fourth movement and that brings us probably to the fourth movement right yeah and we can go, we can take that right into our our beautiful fourth movement where our our four note motive opens right off, whereas though before it, it appeared to us in a minor key, because um, I think it starts on the seventh scale degree. So it puts it in this spookier sound uh, coming, you know, it's on this happy music and it's got this da, 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 da. Um, But now it has a rather, I would say kind of a, a heroic sound, which is not quite um, the topic for today, but interesting how a simple shift in tonality can take the same structure and contour and, and completely shift our interpretation emotionally of what of what we're getting from that. Um, so yeah, we open right up with what is now our heroic ba, re, fa, mi. And this is going to lead us on to quite a journey uh, through this last most famous of these four movements where things get a little bit fugal. Fugal, yeah. It's yeah. Funny. Fugal, yeah. Yeah, it's fugal with an L. There is a fugal all over the place. And he's also playing around with a with a with a with with yeah, with the structure. I mean, all of a sudden there is uh, after he presented the first team, there is already a small a small development. For example, in bar bar, let me see, I have the score in front of me. But but uh, so he starts with the first team, da 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 da. Then you have the the second team, yam pala, very triumphal. And then in bar thirty six, there is already a small, as a, as a, as a small uh, uh, intermezzo. Um, there's already a, a kind of a sort of development, a mini development, yeah, where he already introduces that big moment that will appear later on, where. We have all those teams playing be played at the at the, at, the, at the same time, and then he goes back to the then he goes back to the to the to the normal structure of the of, of his exposition. For example, when the, the third team comes in around around bar seventy ish, seventy three, seventy four, ba da da a completely different uh, character. But then again, in ninety four, when he presented the the third team again, he makes a little intersection. Where, where that for me can be considered as a as a pre development as a as a as a pre yeah he's like preparing that 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 great moment in 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 I would say in music history not only in this symphony but in, in, in for sure history and then he's building 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 and then again in one thirty one thirty six. It was again uh, a, a, a mini development with all those uh, different introductions of the tea, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. So it's all about about fugative entrances and about connection uh, to the uh, to the uh, baroque music. So already in the in the presentation of the in the exposition of uh, of, of the first symphony, many things are happening different from habit. Yeah, very much. And I, I did, there's there is like um. There's a there's a tension here between two different styles, and as I was as I was researching for this, you know, I pulled out the trusty old Alfred Einstein, Mozart, his character, his work, and he makes a really good point about this this contrast between the Gallant style, this early 18th century kind of you'd almost call it post Baroque, this where we I think we get like C.P.E. Bach and um, 
Stamets and, uh, you know, other names that are, are escaping my brain right now. But, you know, the early Ro the early classical composers before Haydn and Mozart come and give us all of this meat. It was a much it was a much simpler musical style where the Baroque was, I mean, even by the name, ornamented and kind of for their ears now becoming overwrought. People wanted simple, direct, almost even populist music. Yeah. And Mozart comes from this, but as we've been, you know, hinting at through this whole talk, as he ages, he becomes more and more drawn to this older learned style as as Einstein points out. And so we've got this opera buffa, let's talk directly to the people if you can't understand it in the front, you know, in the back row standing seats, then it's not worth anything and also this more educated academic which in the early 1700s, you might have called like a, a stuffier kind of music, but Mozart's drawn to both of them. And he's trying to find a way to shove them together. And so what we get is this fourth movement that is, it is still contained within sonata form. It, it kind of still on the surface follows the rules of what sonata form does, but within its own sections, he's pretending to be, to be J.S. Bach. And Already, as we're just talking about this exposition, he's given us all these little motivic materials, which are going to become crucially important for the for the grand finale of this thing. But as you were kind of hinting at something, we had a Beethoven connection where he's doing things that Beethoven would pick up the ball and run with later. The, the famous finale of this movement is not the recapitulation, but the coda which is something that as you know, Beethoven's Eroica symphony is also kind of rather famous for doing this kind of, yes, I'm playing in sonata form, but I'm also going to reject this sonata form that I'm, I'm filling out the sheets as I'm supposed to. Yes, we have our exposition, we got our development, we do our recapitulation and it's great, but the coda is really kind of the point of it all. No, I, 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 I yeah, you described it in a, in a, in a in a perfect way, it's like the the synthesis of uh, of this of this last of this complete last uh, last symphony, and you feel you, f you really feel the, the inner need again. I pointed it out already before to escape from 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 the classical form. Although he's he's still in it, he's still in that in that prison kind of prison. But but you can feel that he he wants to break he wants to break out, and I, I think and that brings us to. To, to, to the famous, famous couple of bars in music history where he, uh, at, at the end, he's, he's playing around with uh, five different teams, a superposition of five different, uh, different teams. It's not a fugue, it's fugative. So that means that the way he, he treats it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like in a theater play, it would be a, a chaotic conversation between five characters each telling his or her own line but still in a harmonic uh, environment uh, and and it, it's it's for me especially I, I will mention the bars but between 388 and uh, let's say 402 it's probably the 20 bars the most generous bars ever written by Mozart and probably written by any other composers uh, of, of his uh, of his time. Magic. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out that these are not five new themes. These are, in fact, all the themes that he's planted, including the one that came from the, the third movement, which started us off. It's yeah. the themes that make up the first theme, the second theme. We've all heard them before, and now they get shoved and mixed around each other. And amazing, and probably later on we will talk a little bit about about the famous recordings of this piece. Amazing how how different uh, approaches uh, some conductors and some orchestras have. Uh, and I'm, when I'm listening to a recording of this this symphony, I'm, I'm always interested in, in 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 hearing those those ten bars. What are what are orchestras and conductors doing doing with this with this? bars in order to to keep the transparency of the of, of, of the five of the five teams uh, the superposition of the of the of the five te of the five teams it's absolutely a major major work uh, I, I I love it very very complex very complex to, to perform first of all you must understand the architecture of the of the piece the 
why he wrote this piece, uh, what we were talking about uh, for the last for the last for the last hour, uh, and uh, if. It helps a lot when, when you perform this piece and you know you have all this information in, in the back of your mind. It, uh, it, 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 it helps, helps a lot. And the more, the more you know about the background of, of the symphony, the, the, the more you can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And the more you can enjoy everything that comes after. Oh, yeah. you know, it just it popped into my head too, because as Beethoven you know, continues to get older, we start seeing fugues few or fugal writing in the end. I mean, that ninth symphony, that whole, I mean, how many different fugal contrapuntal entrances are, are, I wonder how many other German composers start off simple and end up writing fugues. They just, you just can't escape Bach for long. Yeah. Yeah. But probably we can, we can, we can finish talking a little bit about, about uh, the recording strategy and the recording results. Um, yeah. Uh, probably I don't know if people know that that that, that this this uh, Mozart never heard the the symphony in, in his lifetime, so it was only premiered after after he uh, he, he he passed away. But the, the, just some some facts and figures, some some trivia that probably people are interested in. The the very first performance in the U.S. of the symphony was uh, uh, in 1843. Yeah, very first mm. performance, and it was uh, an orchestra uh, conducted by um, Henry Smith, American conductor Henry Smith. It was in the Academy of Music in uh, in Boston, Boston Audion. Yeah, and then the first recording, the first recording of that that symphony uh, was in 1913, and it was also by uh, an American orchestra, by the Victor Concert Orchestra. In the 19, back in 1913, and the conductor was uh, William Rogers. And the, the Victor Orchestra was called after Victor August Herbert, who was an American uh, cellist and composer and uh, conductor who, who was born around 1816 and, and passed away early, early 20th 20, 20 century. So he had his own, his own orchestra, and his orchestra, his orchestra made a very, very, very first recording ever of this uh, symphony. But I think I just wanted to point out a couple of uh, interesting recordings. Of course, you have the, the, 18, the orchestra of the 18th century conducted by Franz Bruggen, who really analyzed every single note and uh, they, uh, uh, they did a recording on, uh, on uh, epoch instruments, on original instruments. Then there is Lorin Mazel, uh, a recording with the Sinfonica di Galicia with a, a Spanish orchestra, quite, quite modern uh, concept in terms of uh, uh, sound production and in terms of, uh, of tempi, quite fast tempi. Then, of course, we have the Leonard Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic. As we know, he, he had a long-time relationship, recording relationship with the Vienna Philharmonic. He recorded all Beethoven symphonies, a lot of Haydn symphonies, and a lot of Mozart. It's very interesting, uh, an American conductor coming from a completely different background, uh, what, what he did with, with tempi, with transparency, and with uh, sound production. Very interesting. Uh, of course, Bruno Walter is one of the one of the old uh, old school uh, uh, interpretations with the Columbia Symphony. Then, very interesting to mention is uh, Sir uh, Neville Mariner with the Academy of Saint Martin in the Fields in London. One of one of the first conductors together with Harold Kuhl, who really studied uh, started studying uh, classical music in a completely different uh, different way. And then, of course, nowadays, the Academy of Ancient Music in the UK in London with uh, Christopher Hogwood, uh, very interesting. But there are five top recordings. And number one is definitely is the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra conducted by a fellow countryman, René Jacobs. I don't know if you're familiar with the name René oh. Jacobs, but uh, actually he lives, he, lives, he lives just a couple of blocks away from here. Um, this 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 is amazing. So he he tried to 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 have a, 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 a an approach. Uh, 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 so he he ignored all the music that had been written after the Jupiter Symphony, and he tried to restore the original concept uh, in a very authentic uh, way with uh, with with on the rock instruments. So. Very, very interesting, very, very innovative in, in, in tempi and again in transparency. And, and, and I love what he did with that famous 
20 bars where the five themes come together. It's such, such clear, the, 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 the vocabulary and the transparency of the instrumentation and of the, of the way of playing is so clear. It's like clear as water. You can hear every voice separately. Amazing recording. Then, of course, we have uh, Nicolas Harnoncourt, who's the, who's the godfather of uh, the new approach of re interpreting uh, classical and baroque music in an authentic way with the chamber orchestra of, uh, of Europe. Probably he has less imagination than uh, René Jacobs, but um, he has an eye for details and for articulation. He, he really goes very deep into uh, uh, the world of articulation. Really love it. And then we have uh, Sir Thomas Beecham. It's an, it's an older uh, British recording with a Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, what is interesting in this recording, Beecham didn't do the repeats. He didn't do any repeat. He mm. just played it from the beginning to the end. So that makes that the symphony is probably 10 minutes shorter than it should be. The, the full length of the symphony is 33, 34, depending on the tempi. So the recording is set on much beach and it's uh, much, much uh, 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 shorter. And then we have, of course, the Mozart specialist is Charles Macarias. Charles Macarias uh, with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. Um, very clear transparency, not very emotional, but very clear, very old, old school uh, uh, Mozart. And then very interesting is the last one I want to recommend. It's an old recording uh, going back to uh, 1926. It's uh, with the uh, Staatskapelle Berlin, conducted by Richard Strauss. Oh. Richard Strauss. I mean, his concept of orchestration and, and sound production is, uh, well, we all know his works. And, 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 and so it's, it's a, a fantastic, late romantic uh, uh, composer, very interesting with big orchestral explosions, and et cetera. Um, so his interpretation, interpretation is quite wild. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, Mozart a la, a la Richard Strauss. Also, and also this, the, the speed of the finale is so fast. It's so fast, oh my God. But it's, at the same time, it, it has a, um, it's, it's clear, transparent in a way or another. And it's very, um, it has a lucidity. Uh, it, it, it's very ast astonishing playing. So I would absolutely recommend to listen uh, to all those recordings, but especially the five key recordings I, I just mentioned. Well, we all have our homework. Uh set out for us, I guess. And we've got uh, a little more than a year to do it before we actually get back in the hall and we can hear this symphony with our great players uh, on our concert next year. So thanks so much for talking to us about it today, Dirk. We've got, I'm sure there's, we could go on for ever about anything with this symphony. We can get more and more in depth, but hopefully that's a good starting point. Go get your recordings, get your Alfred Einstein books and uh, <laughs> yeah. Tackle it, tackle it yourselves at home. So thanks so much, everyone. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you, Dirk, for joining us. Bye-bye. Have a good one.